Good morning, everyone, to those joining us on Facebook. Today, we're here to do a reflection on the role of monuments in the Caribbean and ask a question, ask and try to answer questions about whether or not they are reflective of our colonial legacy or our national heritage or its attention between the two. Um, today, let me first begin by introducing myself. My name is Shani Ropo. I'm curator of the University of the West Indies Museum, which is located in the regional headquarters across from the Mona campus in Jamaica. Today, we are joined by Dr. Heather Cato, um, Dr. Petrina Dakers, and Dr. Tara Innes. Dr. Cato is a senior lecturer in Caribbean history at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus and is the current Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Her research focus has led to revisionary approaches to plantation and enslavement systems in the Caribbean. And her publications include Turning Tides Caribbean Intersections in the Americas and Beyond, co-edited with Milo Riggio, Beyond Tradition, Reinterpreting the Caribbean Historical Experience, co-edited with Rita Pemberton, and The Caribbean in the Atlantic World, co-authored with John Campbell and several others. Dr. Cato is the president of the Association of Caribbean Historians. Dr. Petrina Dakers is head of the art history department at Edna Manley College for the Visual and Performing Arts. She specializes in public sculpture, memory and memorial practices, and the Caribbean and Black Dis in the Caribbean and the Black, Dis um, Black Diaspora Art. Her research has focused on Jamaican national history and public sculpture, the relationship between contemporary art, death and memory and recently on the trope of Queen Victoria in the African diaspora. Her publications include Monuments and Meaning, But Paul Bogle Was a Bold Man, Vision, History and Power for a New Jamaica in Small Acts, and the forthcoming book The Statue in the Park commemorating Queen Victoria's, um, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in Jamaica. Dr. Tara Innes is a lecturer in the Department of Philosophy, History and Philosophy at Cave Hill Campus, the University of the West Indies, and director of the UEOAS Caribbean Heritage Network. The areas of focus for her teaching and research include history of medicine, history of social policy, and heritage and social development. She has served as a delegate for the government of Barbados on, world, on the World Heritage Committee and is a member of Barbados research teams for UNESCO World Heritage Property, Historic Bridgetown and its garrison, and the nomination for the Industrial Heritage of Barbados, the story of book and story of sugar and rum, pardon me. She currently sits on several committees for the Bar for Barbados World Heritage Committee. Barbados Museum and Historical Society and Association of Caribbean Historians. So a word on structure for our public. We're going to, each presenter is going to speak for 10 minutes, um, <clears throat> kind of positioning themselves in, rela in relation to the current debates around history and heritage. And then we're going to move into a discussion um, around some key questions, also referencing their presentations, and then during which we would have, we would accept questions from the audience. So please feel free to type your questions in our Facebook comments so that you can be a participant in this discussion. And we look forward to everybody's thoughts on this, what is now a very pressing issue around discussions of heritage representation and monuments. Thank you. So our first speaker will be Dr. Heather Cato.
Okay, good morning. Apologies for the delay. I was having some problems with sharing and, and getting um, access to my mic. I want to start by just showing you a picture of the monument that I'm going to be basing my discussion on. Heather, I'm sorry, the sound, your sound is um, out. All right, is that back in? Yes, it's, it's back. Okay, great. On the left here, we have the statue of Columbus that I'm going to focus on. And on the right, I have another statue of Columbus that is located in Maruba. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because it seems to be creating problems, but I wanted to end with a picture showing you some of the protests around the statues and, 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 and how people have taken the statue and created their own impression of what they think the statue should represent. Now this- Sorry, Heather, I'll share your screen so you should be able to speak. I'll share the presentation. So that it should be just see. the last picture. The last picture, okay, no problem. Okay, this is just what I wanted to share with you. I, wa I wanted to share what has happened in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and, and this is an ongoing thing and the city always has to go back in and clean up the statue. So this has been going on since around 2017. But of course, um, recently, there has been far more protest about the statue. Now this statue of Columbus is located in the center of Columbus Square which is situated at the corner of Independence Square and Duncan Street in Port of Spain, Trinidad. This statue is a gift from Hippolyte Board, a wealthy cocoa planter in 1881. It's an iron statue. It stands on a platform. You can see that it is embellished with four gargoyles. And of course you have these semicircular basins below. This memorial is credited to the person who, quote unquote, discovered Trinidad in 1498. But it has become the central focus of the movement to remove the symbols of the colonizers in our society. Though it is part of an international movement, it is led by the Trinidad and Tobago Crossroads Freedom Project. Their support from segments of our indigenous community for replacement with a freedom fighter. There's also a public put petition with over 7,000 signatures. The city of Port of Spain has started its own poll on its Facebook page. They have over 400 comments and so far, most of them seem to be in favor of removal. So this 1881 memorial has become a site of contestation in Trinidad in 2020. Look at the pictures I had at the beginning of the presentation, which I thought you saw, and look at where we are now in 2020. To fully contextualize, I want to suggest that we must understand the international context, which is part of several countries rethinking ways in which Christopher Columbus has been memorialized. We also have to consider the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement. But I think we must consider the Trinidad Caribbean context. The Caribbean can be described, as we know, as a scene of contestation. If we take Trinidad, for example, our island was discovered by the Spanish, colonized by the French, captured by the British. We have a history of cursive labor systems, the encomienda system, enslavement, indentorship. These are at our very foundation. With independence, political power was grasped from the white elite. Thus, Afro and Indo Trinidadians predominate in the political realm, but the majority of the population has not made the rise up the economic ladder. 
This is now complicated with class distinctions which generally reflect racial and ethnic distinctions. On the surface, if you look at us, we are a diverse multi-ethnic society. We are a place where several racial and ethnic groups coexist peacefully. And we have accepted much of each other's culture. Our culture is described as a Creole culture and diversity has been thought of as our middle name. However, I want to suggest today that we have not fully reckoned with our past. The most visible manifestations of these are periodic outbreaks of protests, the 1930s, the 1970s, 1990, and most recently in 2020. The numerous narratives intersect on our little islands. A history characterized by cruelty, violence, racism, colonization. People with amazing determination, creativity, and survival instincts. Enduring legacies of empire, dependency, and marginalization in the international system. A people characterized by hybridity and blending of cultures. A conundrum of diaspora versus national identity. And immigration and all its complexities. Our societies have proven to be resilient to the process of decolonization, especially symbolic decolonization. Independence has not brought the extent of transformation hoped for. We are very much in the middle of what, of what I like to describe as the process of becoming. The role of museums and monuments and other cultural vehicles have not been sufficiently engaged by the population or the government. And this sector remains underdeveloped. It has been used primarily for tourism attraction as opposed to community empowerment. The discussions in our public domain includes renaming our national awards, renaming Milner Hall to Freedom Hall, removal of the Columbus statue, and a request for a tribunal to identify monuments and names which need to be replaced. These developments have in fact created new spheres of conflict and have distanced some people from the kind of advocacy that is needed. It has shown up divisions in the society which were there under the surface, but not in the open. The public discourse in Trinidad and Tobago has concentrated on statues and renaming visible symbols of possession. But what about the invisible? Can we deal with the visible without reckoning with the invisible? How do we bridge the two? Surely this must be part of a bigger, more holistic process. At their core, these are really demands for cultural signifiers from segments of our population. But these are not generally articulated as what it is. It is a phase in our development that we must navigate for us to enter another phase of Caribbean nationhood. Several issues have become visible. It has shown us, a, a, it has shown up the lack of historical knowledge in the general population. It has become apparent that we must confront past historical wrongs, but are we doing it in the right way? How do we create sites of conscience and not just new sites of contestation? How do we include other ethnic groups and other cultural groups? How do we deal with text and language when we are dealing with several different groups? How do we take that additional step of activating the history, of creating public dialogue, of making connections to the challenges we face today? How do we deal with the trauma that some of these discussions can cause in our communities? And does one size fit all? Does the nature of the pain in different territories and among different groups require a different response? How is the authority shared for the documentation of local culture in a place like Trinidad and Tobago? Decolonization must involve expanding perspectives beyond those of the dominant cultural groups. In the public domain, there is no discussion of these issues outside of periodic outbreaks of contestation. I want to suggest that we need to find a bridge. We need to get a bridge 
into new and revised academic insights. And I want to ask, can this bridge be the very monuments and memorials that are causing so much contestation? I want to suggest that it is time to revisit the role of monuments and museums as active sites, not just as education, but for public healing in Trinidad and Tobago. It is time also for us to outline a process. We need to develop guidelines. We need to determine how under, and under what circumstances a national historic designation will be removed. We need to determine where it will be placed and how it will be represented here. It is time for us to transform, to transform sites of contestation into sites of conscience. And it is time to make this very important process part of our national history. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cato. So I'll ask our next presenter, Dr. Dakers, who will be speaking about, do we need another national hero? Is all right, I think I may have gotten that wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, can you share the link? Um, can you tell us what is the name of the, the link? Because I'm getting some questions about where to check in. So what what's the site? Oh, okay, of so we've had um so the first problem is that um the YouTube stream won't start. Oh, so they have to go to the um, UE Museum Facebook page mm -hmm. where they will see the event being streamed live um, just as you go to the page. Okay. So, so they you... so just need to go straight to the page. So okay. um, please apologize. We tried multiple times and the YouTube, YouTube kept dropping despite okay. multiple test runs <laughs> um, both this morning and earlier in the week. So okay, no. please, you know, just for everybody who's watching, um, just if you have somebody who's trying to check in, please ask them to go to the YouTube um, page. Mm -hmm. If they don't have YouTube, um, not YouTube, sorry, Facebook page. If they don't have Facebook, we are recording this event and it will be posted to our um, to our YouTube channel. So it will be available for persons to watch. And if they have comments, they can also just contact us via um, our email. Okay. Okay, great. Let me share a screen. Okay. <clears throat> so do we need another hero? That's the, the, the title. So in preparing for this panel, it was very hard to, for me to decide where to begin. So I thought I would start with um, an honest reaction um, to an experience I had in William Grant Park in downtown Kingston. Um, a story, of, this is a story I've shared with a few people. Several years ago, I was in the park documenting the 19th century statues that it houses. And as I photographed the statue of Edward Jordan seen on the screen, the 19th century politician, businessman, and newspaper owner, I got into a discussion with a man who was watching my activities. He wanted to know who he was. And so I briefly introduced Jordan. <clears throat> and I said, I told him that the image, I thought the image was important because it was the first public statue that I know of, of, of a non-white person in Jamaica. He got excited by the information, but also upset because he thought the statue made Jordan quote unquote look white. I wasn't sure if he was referring to Jordan's phenotypical features or the material of the statue. So I explained, well, he was a brown man of mixed ancestry and marble was a typical sculptural material with an elevated status. Though of course, bronze was a material um, option being utilized by artists during, this 19, during the 19th century. A point, of course, I didn't get to um, discuss with him because he was insistent that Jordan was a black man and the image misrepresented him and needed to change. So I chimed in, well, actually the 19th, in the 19th century, Jordan was actually considered brown and in that time, brownness was quite distinct from blackness and Jordan advocated for the recognition of these social distinctions of color. So the man in the park though, really didn't care for my caution about using black as a descriptor for this 19th century figure. 
um, by this time he became more animated. He was insistent in Jordan's blackness and threatened to pour black paint on the statue to highlight his racial identity. Then his ire turned to the statue of Queen Victoria, which was close by, threatening to knock it down. At that point, I made my way from the conversation because I felt in the exchange, I also was becoming frustrated. So I went on my way and eventually um, paused to reflect on the exchange. I was angry that he was insistent on using a very contemporary and American, Americanized um, standard for deciding on Jordan's racial identity. But also the exchange made me think about my own investment in objects and images, um, image of, images of art that I would begin to really feel angry at his iconoclastic suggestions. I recently told a friend of mine yesterday that I'm sometimes, I am affected when public images are destroyed or mutilated or removed in particular contexts. As was the case of the Christopher Gonzalez's Bob Marley statue in the 1980, the Edna Manley statue, which was um, purposely um, sort of um, vandalized um, within the last 10 years, but the statue has not been uh, put back in, in place. It's, it's still at the, the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. And of course, um, because of the recent sort of painting out of popular Don figures on building facades by the police, this has meant that other types of commemorative wall portraits have been discouraged and have shifted indoors or in yards. So I may not necessarily feel loyalty to an, an individual object or image, but in general feel public images, um, teaching about art and or ever-changing social and political experiences. So destroying, deciding to destroy or remove a public work of art is a serious issue for me. My friend um, dismissed my own admission of investment in public art as my Eurocentric training in thinking about art practice. And he may very well be right. But I wanted to start with this exchange between myself and the man in the park to say public images do matter. They matter to me as a researcher in public statues. I'm constantly amazed um, by the conversations that they engender around art and around our social and political life. I'm surprised when I, in fact, get upset um, by them or by their treatment. They matter to all of us um, for various reasons. So I wanted to put myself in this conversation. The meaning of public images might change depending on the context. Their resonance might change. They may become invisible or silent over time, which is part of the experience of public statues. Um, that over time they may be sort of become part of or taken for granted signs of the city that we don't really see them but um, may use them for directions or as a, as a meeting point but in particular moments they matter urgently in jamaica most commemorative monuments to colonial figures are actually housed in churches and they appear as um, wall or floor plaques um, and wall sculptures. There are relatively few full-size freestanding Jamaican colonial statues. And the earliest is the Rodney Memorial. I was uh, going to go into this uh, a bit, but this is the image that was used for the publicity um, photo for this event. Um, this was done by um, John Bacon, um, who was an, an esteemed um, sculptor. And um, it was in honor of Admiral Rodney, who was the victor of the Battle of the Saints in 1782, which um, secured um, England, Jamaica for England um, against, the, against the French. This, was, this statue was, in fact, um, one of the most really expensive um, statue in the colonial era. And in, in fact, it's part of an entire um, sort of building system. It has a cupola on top of it. It's connected to um, a sort of um, a set of, a set of a government buildings. So it was a very expensive endeavor. And in fact, um, the statues that came after it didn't really rival the sort of grandeur of this of this work. Um, that is the statue and the um, the, the facades are around it. There are several 19th century images. Oh, this slide has jumped. Um, 19, um, 19th century images that are now housed in William Grant Park, um, including 
Edward Jordan, who I mentioned before in 1875. And the earliest um, statue in the park was um, in honor of Governor Metcalf. And um, that was done in um, 1845. And then um, there were about two other statues created um, in the park. But the most important um, of the statue, I would argue, set of art, uh, the set of statues that were created in the 19th century, um, I would argue is, is Queen Victoria's Edward by Edward Joplowski, um, which was done to commemorate her Diamond Jubilee. So um, <clears throat> this, in many ways, the parks, the sort of the statues in the park, um, Governor Metcalf, um, Edward Jordan, and um, other sort of active other politicians, and um, initially Father Dupont, a statue to Father Dupont, who was a French, um, a, a French religious leader who whose statue was created to um, because of his work with the poor. So they sort of represent the sort of collection of images represent. Um, a symbolic landscape of political, moral, and social power in the 19th century. Um, in the 19th and early, in the 19th um, century um, and early 20th century, um, these statues really, or sorry, sorry, today these statues really don't have a strong um, public visibility. Partly because the park was bifurcated um, with um, a, a through road. It, in the sort of early early 20th century, um, late 19th century, they had these statues had a stronger visibility. visibility. Now the statue is enclosed, um, and so they have a sort of much more decorative um, function. The Queen Victoria statue, for instance, moved from her very prominent position at the south entrance to the park to the East Queen Street entrance, and her back faces the city while she looks over the park. The power of these statues were also eroded because Jamaica created its own alternate system of um, commemorative, heroic commemorative monuments, both figurative and architectural. For the Pan-Africanist leader, Marcus Garvey, for um, leaders such as Nani, Sam Sharp, George William Gordon, and for nationalist um, leaders, Bustamante and um, Norman Manley. And of course, and in, in fact, the statue of Manley and Bustamante stand quite of place at the north and south entrance of William Grant Park. These new heroes and images were part of a larger process which began in the 60s and 70s of creating a new national culture and new national history after independence in 1952. So these images were central to the creation of a new citizenry to build a new sense of confidence in the local population that would help to accept new ideas of leadership and a new look or a new image of leadership. The call for new heroes were initiated by activists such as Garvey who argued in the, um, in the 20s for black people to quote, forget his hero worshiping of other races and to create and emulate heroes of his own. Why not see good and perfection in ourselves, he said. And also by historians by the 19, uh, who by the 1940s really argued for a new Caribbean history from the perspective of the local population. So these local calls for new heroes were then co-opted by the state in, in, into a new cultural policy in Jamaica in the mid 1960s. So I would argue the existing statues do not really have the same kind of social and political power as they did in the 19th century, because there were other parallel images sanctioned by the state throughout the Jamaican landscape, whose powers are reinforced by their prominence in the landscape and historical and other texts, local myths, popular and folk songs, and other types of visual art. The national memory of Jamaica pivots around these other her heroic figures. But Jamaica's independence was not a revolutionary process with a radical break from the colonial past. So the question is, do these objects, despite the challenge to their, to their power by our own heroic system, continue to be threatening because of course the colonial experience was violent psychologically and physically? Do they continue to symbolize the white supremacist values from which we really never fully recovered or replaced? 
So the ongoing conversations that come up from time to time on what do we do with these colonial monuments, like my conversation in the park, tell us that they can still have an, a powerful affect. So if as a community we decide, yes, they still have efficacy, they undermine our sense of self, what, is, what it is to be Jamaican or we can broaden it to, um, to what it means to be Bajan or Vincentian or Ketitian and what it is to be human in this modern world, then we really must destroy or remove these images, absolutely. But the Jamaican case is cautionary. So over, over 50 years of constructing and celebrating a local heroic system tells us that parallel images are not enough. And I think um, um, Dr. Heather, whose name, last name I forget, but Heather, um, argument. And in fact, Jamaican artists have not been afraid to use these new heraldic and heroic symbols to challenge our social and political environment like Matthew McCarthy's work that you see here. Image for image is not enough. Um, colonialism and racism is a long process and our work towards a more just and equal society to a fully decolonized society has to be long and all encompassing um, process to which we're all committed. And art does and can have a place in this process. Caribbean artists such as Hugh Locke have engaged public statues, dressing them up or rather the photographs he takes of them with paint um, and, and other objects challenge or reflect on the on their power and legacies. So this is a work on the left, Victoria, this is a photograph that he took of um, the Victoria statue in, um, in Guyana. And um, he's been doing work, uh, he has done work of statues in England and this his most recent work of statues in the States. Um, so he's, he sort of dressed up these images and we can use these model, this model whereby we invite artists annually to organize public art projects around particular monuments and use these projects as part of our ongoing battle against colonialism's legacies and to challenge how we see and experience these images to create our own version of what James Young calls anti-monuments to make them part of our ongoing memory work and reckoning with history to help us to think about the process of objectifying and the process of memory, memory work. This is not a particularly new solution, but one that I find interesting. In our dismantling, image for image is not enough. For in the Jamaican um, case, we embrace the 19th century nationalist projects of heroic worship that we inherited from Europe with its same biases and limitations. For example, with respect to the limited presence of monumental female images through which we can imagine our national self. In many ways, this very conversation and the conversations that occur throughout the region on who can become um, heroes um, is a reckoning with the acceptance of the structures that we inherited. We needed to be, we needed to be, um, be a nation. Nations need history and um, national history needs to be manifested through monuments, political monuments. So these are ideas and uh, structures that we, that we inherited. So part of the problem is our investment in a Eurocentric memory work through political statues. And if we're going to dismantle, I would like us to just, not just to replace heroes for heroes, but be bold enough to create our own systems of memory work. One that is based on our own cultural and historical experience. And, and I think Dr. Heather is also making that same claim. What can a public memory work project based on let's say carnival or, or popular music um, like for um, look like, for instance. This is an argument I made in 2002 during the controversy over the redemption song Emancipation uh, Monument in Jamaica. Cultural memory in the Caribbean is unique. As scholars such as Walcott, Scott and Harris have noted the modern Caribbean was born out of the experience of modernity through the enslavement of millions of people, the displacement of mass murder and mass murder of the indigenous population mass migration, forced and voluntary to the region um, uh, of people from different parts of the world, the long history of colonialism and violence and pain and terror, which resulted in fragmented cultural practices, ideas and histories that manifest themselves sometimes in hybrid forms. So our cultural experience and memory is tied to the colonial project. So what if we were to use this very unique historical and cultural experience of terror of fragmentation and hybridity to guide the practice of public images and public memory work. What would we do? What would we create? 
would we still create objects and images as we know as we know them today? If we are to use our experience as a guide, the question still remains: what do we do with these colonial images or these colonial monuments? Do they then still have a, a use value in this new system? The end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Petrina. Okay, so um, our next speaker is Dr. Inez. Oh, so yeah. All right. So just just checking, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody in Facebook land and, and for the UE Museum for inviting us here today to discuss this, this very important topic that's kind of gripping the region. Um, you know, this is just one aspect of, I think, a larger conversation that is happening, not just around the place of public history um, in, in the, in the so-called Black Lives Matter movement globally, but it is also about what human rights should stand for today and how does that, how does our, our relationship to human rights and, and what is happening, especially in the United States and, and um, uh, by extension in the United Kingdom, how is that playing out on our landscape today? So I do wanna speak a little bit to that reality. Um, as I said on, on some Facebook posts, I mean, I've, I've resisted quite quite clearly um, in my, my, uh, my career, my professional development to, to really try limiting my discussion or about Nelson because um, personally, I just, I've, I have always felt like it is, is a conversation that is yet again, that we're purposing for this, for this, uh, for this moment in time, we're purposing the life of yet another white man who has di uh, dominance on our landscape. So um, I kind of was playing with the idea of turning around Nelson, let's, let's move him. Um, sure, let's move him. Why, why, why do we have to keep him where he is? But can we move on? And it's, it's the question, can we really move on from some of the discussions that are taking place today? So in, in terms of my very limited um, uh, reflections on on him. I mean, on Facebook, I said, you know, as a historian, I do find it very troubling um, to remove history from anything, um, our landscape, our schools, our minds. Of course, this has all happened, so I'm I'm much more concerned about that. I I, I really don't necessarily, as I've said, care for what Nelson means personally to to me and and to my personal development. I think a lot of people do but i think we should be questioning and we should be more concerned about why we're fixating on a need to remove him from the landscape and i think there's something that's really not being answered um within us as barbadians as, as a people that that needs to be addressed and i'm trying to figure out all the time what what is that um and the question i think that keeps coming up is does he need to be there um, should we move him um, and should or should we just keep turning him around like this very endless debate with no resolution? So these were three central questions that I, I had wanted to kind of grapple with. Um, just, just so you're um, aware and, and some of your viewers are aware, uh, the Admiral Lord Nelson uh, was um, a, a very heroic figure at the end of a, a, a very lengthy period of conflict between the Revolutionary Wars um, uh, that gripped kind of Western Western Europe and, and North America and, and then into the Napoleonic um, Wars as well. And he emerges as this very uh, heroic uh, figure um, for the British Empire and a number of monuments. I think there are about 14 monuments that have been erected across um, what would be the British Empire, a former British Empire, um, and uh, this particular monument in in Bridgetown, which stands quite prominently in an area right across from our our Parliament buildings. Um, this particular monument is um, was erected by public subscription, so a number of Barbadians um, of many many different. Um, 
castes and cute and hues in in the society did subscribe to buy a, a plot of land that used to be called Egerton's Green um, and they established something called Trafalgar Square and uh, they erected this monument which was by um, a very famous sculptor uh, uh, Wes McCott and it, it arrived in Barbados and it was established and erected um, to much fanfare and has been has been a major part of the Barbadian landscape and particularly the Bridgetown's landscape for a number of years. Uh, but it after independence, it became the site of a lot of contestation um, and particularly questioning um, Nelson's own views on slavery. And really the, the whole conflict comes to a head in 1999 when uh, the government of Barbados chose to um, rename this space National Hero Square or it was in the proximity of what was called National Hero Square. And uh, the, a little bit of gerrymandering, I think, has has gone on um, even after turning him around. There was questions about, you know, was he really in National Hero Square or was he not? You know, there were lots of questions around this, and he has been periodically vandalized uh, because this is not necessarily a representation of of what Barbadians see of themselves, and particularly if you're going to call. This, uh, this space, National Hero Square, he's certainly not a hero to um, Barbadians in the post-independence period, um, not only because of his views, but because he also occupies this very dominant space on our landscape. And I think Barbadians may want to think about how they want to move on from this discussion if he is indeed removed. And, um, one of the things I wanted to kind of really put across is that, you know, there's our landscapes are not neutral. They're politically charged spaces that are part of our contested patrimony. By the very nature, they are battlegrounds of consciousness, um, spaces in which we continue to see how processes of genocide, colonization, colonialism, and slavery created distortions in the ways in which we see ourselves. And when I ask the question, we you know, if we are moving Nelson, are we really moving on? Um, should we move on? And what are we moving on to? These are, are things that I think we, we do need to, to start discussing because it's one of the, the things that is missing on our landscape of, of these questions. Um, so after much consultation in, in 1999 and afterwards in 2000, a report came out to actually uh, suggests that he would be moved um, and should be moved um, and uh, move him because he could not be considered as part of the construction of our, our national hero in our construction of our own national identity. And that was 20 years ago and he still has his back to Bar Broad Street so nothing has been done. A whole new generation of Barbadians have now watched within the last four to five months see their freedoms curtailed due to this microscopic virus, the coronavirus, and many have seen the collapse of their tourism dependent economy. Many have wondered out loud what about what their future holds, but probably the most compelling imagery that we've seen through the media like social platforms while we, we have had to give up our own freedoms um, in order to think about others globally. Many of us did it willingly and compliantly for something that looked like it mattered. But when we saw yet another black man in the United States, uh, George Floyd, um, being unjustly pursued and executed by the police, like the lives we were um, staying home to protect, the very moral fabric of our own compliance and thread, lay threadbare before us. And many of us crumpled and then we rose up. Why? Because the police state in which we have all um, been living did not protect that particular life. It was the historic and colonial and racist mentalities that have kept us trapped and imprisoned that do not protect our lives today. So in tiny Barbados, Nelson and this space that does not belong to empire and we're not sure that it be actually belongs to us is the space in which we have focused this frustration and anger um, 
the comfort and security of our capitalist world in the midst of colonial uh, and slavery, or, slavery erasure that it has been built on lie naked on our streets. Not even the gaze of the tourist could save it. And I think this is a very interesting um, aspect of the discussion. So in the past, you know, this idea that the British tourists will want to see Nelson in place in situ has always been a, a rallying cry for people. But there are no tourists right now. So where are they? They're not here. They're, they're, they're somewhere else. And guess what? They're starting to see the naked, ugly truth too. And I'm not sure they will need to come back to a space where Nelson is incongruous, but yet very dominant. And one of the things that I, I think we, we need to, to put at the very forefront of this discussion is if we are indeed choosing to move on to something else or if we're just going to leave Nelson there or leave Nelson in, in, in this discussion, in this debate, is um, if we are going to move on, should it not be to less static representations of moments in time? Statues don't necessarily serve the purpose we want to want them to and uh, to serve in modern Barbados. Let us be engaged with our environment and create spaces that serve to commemorate our emancipation process that are responsive to our needs today, but help us to reflect about our past. Will moving Nelson help us to move on to a new paradigm in our public memory? Maybe, I, I'm not sure. Maybe we can discuss that. But let us move on to the clear absence on our lab landscape of the representation of our African and enslaved and free past. I shouldn't have to walk onto a plantation in the 21st century in Barbados and not see myself and my ancestors represented, um, only see the glory of what that plantation space was. So when we talk about removing things from our landscape, let us, be e let us equally acknowledge that our landscape has already been cleared quite purposefully of our slave and African past. And I wonder if this has ever really been about Nelson at all. And I think this is a question I would like to leave, leave us all thinking about and contemplating is what is it that is not being served by these discussions that we're having um, in the region? So thank you, I'll just leave it there and, and, and move on to some questions, Shani. Okay, so I, this is, um, I think we've, we're really trying to unpack some very complex issues for which there is no one true answer, right? Um, so as part of our discussion, I had pre-circulated some questions. The first being, what is the role of a monument, right? But what is clear is that this is also about context and the context ultimately defines what the role of a monument is and that context can change over time. So I think just for basic summary, right? We, I don't think we should be answering that specific question because I think that question gets answered over time because one of the things that uh, Dr. Petrual just Katrina had brought out was that, <laughs> yeah, I was trying to be formal, but it's a, it's a bit, it's a lot of work. But um, one of the things that um, Petrina brought out is that the importance of a monument, for example, the Queen Victoria monument had changed over time. And by developing these counter narratives, the monument then becomes decorative as opposed to political. So I think what we really need to be working through, um, and so it brings me to this question, how best, and you guys all hint to it in your, own, in your own ways, how best do we respond to, or how best do we begin the process of reinterpreting some of these monuments, both those that are reflective of a colonial legacy and those that form part of newly constructed national heritages? Um, and I really, you know, and, and this is um, an ongoing discussion because I think all of us as both citizens of the Caribbean and global citizens, but also academics are working through how best this, we do this engagement. So I just would like to hear from you in terms of how, what are some of the pot possible solutions to create spaces for navigating the complexity around monuments? 
and and just to say that this is reflective of some of the questions that are coming from Facebook because they're also about their questions about interpretation right what does this monument do and um, tensions around the historical narrative of the monuments so anybody can start um, you know just uh, and because we're trying to it's a conversation really right well I mean I'll, I'll just start with with Nelson um I think think that we can't look at every single monument that exists, whether it's artistic or in terms of our belt, built heritage, and just decide that we're going to erase them and remove them from, from the landscape. It's very, very important to have the pub, public discussion and, and um, uh, debate. The question of interpretation always comes up, and I'm just going to speak specifically to Nelson. And what could have been interpreted about Nelson has never happened. It has never happened in Barbados, even though we have a World Heritage designation. If you had hired a tour guide to sit out there and, and just give information about why Nelson is where he is and what he meant, means and how Barbadians feel about it, if you put plaques on it, it could not do what I think Barbadians want it to do. And it, it hasn't been done. So perhaps the best place to do that is interpreting it within a museum context. And I don't know how others feel, especially on this panel, but I know in the context of Nelson, and this is just one monument, I think that perhaps nothing will really change if we choose to interpret him elsewhere and particularly in a space that can be dedicated to that, to that interpretation. I just also wanted to add that sometimes with uh, public discussions, you see the conversations happening online and you're not quite sure if it's, if they, they're, if these opinions represent really a large set of the population. And um, so I think con public conversations are really important, um, but we have to have different types of public conversations. So there's ones that are happening happening on social media, but then ones that are happening in churches or in community centers. And we have to um, actually have those um, organized discussions to decide whether or not we should uh, remove some of those, uh, remove these images. So I think that's that's one thing. I, I, do, I do think it's important to be democratic about um, um, what we do with these with these images, having interpretive materials at the site, um, and um, I I think that's also something. This is something I actually had a conversation uh, with someone about yesterday. Whether interpretive ma materials at at the sites themselves really help, because um, you know um, the argument was that people don't really care. They they're not going to look um, if you go into a museum as um, was just being discussed, if you go into a museum, the people who go into the museums are actually interested in having uh, more detailed information. So if you remove an image and you put it into the museum, um, maybe this is where this allows for a much more um, um, useful engagement with, with the image and to have um, a lot more interpretive material. To be honest with you, I'm not sure if I totally, totally buy that argument um, because I feel it's a sort of limited way of thinking about the city and how people move around the city and um, a different way. And I, I, it's also very limited in terms of how we think about our, our um, you know, what a cultural institution can look like. It can, in, in fact, can be part of the city. Um, so, so yeah, so I just wanted to add those, those two things about interpretation and interpretive material. Um, but I also, I guess in the presentation had made some other suggestions about how to engage those images. If we're not gonna throw them all away, one, one thing I think really that we can do is to ask to have artists be a part of this conversation. And we really should have artists be a part of this con conversation because um, these, these are also works of art. Oftentimes, to be honest with you, I mean, and this is just my opinion, I don't find them very interesting, even though I study them. I don't find them as sort of interesting uh, works of art. But there are, but they are works of art. They're created by artists, and to have um, other artists um, today come in and to actually have a, a sort of dialogue or organize a sort of 
um, an interesting event around them can also activate them in a different way or activate the way that we're thinking about them and how they can function in our society. So I think there are different ways that we can um, engage those images. I, I want to say that I, I really don't think there's one correct answer. Yes, absolutely. No, and, and, and that complicates the scenario. I think what we can do, though, is to really understand what we're doing. I, I really feel that, that this is such a stage in our development and evolution in terms of Caribbean nationhood. And, and, and I think if we understand that, um, and then we add the education and the information about these monuments and memorials, we can find a way to move forward. Mm -hmm. I think the magnificent thing about history is that um, anybody who does it understand that things change. Mm -hmm. it, moving thing is, is it's a great thing. Societies change and, and the narrative we want to create changes. And I think if we see it as that and understand that, then we can have the kinds of conversations and, and dialogues. That does not mean 10 years from now, we may not decide, hold on. You know, we want to have a different dialogue, a different narrative, a different kind of shared public space. And, and I really think if we use that perspective, it helps us to move forward. I, it, it helps us to understand how others might feel mm -hmm. and, and, and take that into consideration in the process. Okay, so um, I just, so I, I'm looking at the questions coming in or rather a lot of them are about discussions, yes. right? They're really requiring us to one, not have solely academic discussions, right? But I do think that we have to, so the, the reality is that we need to have multi-tier stakeholder engagements. I think one of the things that has been a problem is that the process of selecting a monument is not an open, transparent, democratized process. And I think a lot of the rejection of monuments in the Caribbean are really a result of that, right? I mean, I, and I think of the case of Jamaica, my own thinking about the failings of the, the national hero story and mm -hmm. monuments and the, the, the gender imbalances that come in the representations of nationhood. Um, and really and truly, are we seeing ourselves in our landscapes through these monuments? I think that one of the things that we, we need to work through, and I, I just want to say for our listeners, um, I'm getting the names, but because the discussion is happening so quickly, <laughs> we're, I'm going to kind of summarize some of the questions um, since we're, in the kind of a reflective process. So I think what we're all saying is that we need a multi-tier um, approach to thinking through monuments, but we also need to have artists at the table, right? Because I think one of the issues too that's happening in the region is how persons who are not a part of the interpretive process think about and reflect about monuments that are created before their time, before their lived experience, but also during their lived experience. And I think it's very important for us to kind of have these layman discussions around artists' representations of heritage and monuments in the public space. One of the questions that have come that has come up um, is about rethinking museums in the Caribbean? Do Caribbean museums truly stand as spaces where we are engaged in this kind of critique, right? Um, and I want to think about um, the um, <laughs> museums in South Africa, for example, the ones that deal with, um, for example, the apartheid museum in which the landscape is also curated to facilitate the complex discussions around histories of trauma. And I think that's what, that is kind of what's missing from our own public historian slash museum debates. How do we navigate these histories of trauma so that everyone can be a part of this discussion and not particular classes of people or people with particular um, um, access, you know, um, well, are those who the, the institutions are stereotyped in such a way about who gets access? So I do think in turn, and um, 
um, Petrina and I do a little bit more museums engagement. But for all of us who are sitting here, because um, majority of my panelists are teachers, right? And even though we're teachers of various histories, we actually have to think about how, how the students engage this, these topics. So for me, what do you think, what do you envision based on our discussion is the possible interventions of museums, parks and public history spaces in this discussion? Let me, let me begin uh, because I, I really see them as the bridge that is needed. Okay. As a historian, I would admit that we have not done the outreach that is necessary. I, 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 I think with all the revisionism and the new perspectives, it, 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 it just has not had the impact that, that, um, that, that, that it should have. And I do think our monuments, our uh, museums can be that link. Um, I'm glad you spoke about um, South Africa. I was also amazed. At Absolutely, it's amazing. It done. And, and I think we really just have to go into a next stage of development of, 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 of this sector. And it, it comes from understanding that they are there to empower people. And, and if we move from that perspective, I think we can make the kinds of transitions um, um, that are needed. You talk just now about taking the dialogue out of academia and, and, and yes, it needs to, and that's an excellent way in where, where you can do it. And you can hear several voices. You, you, you can hear commentaries, you can hear how individual people are affected. So I do think we need to change our whole concept about what a museum is, what it should look like, whose voice takes priority in, 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 in a museum. And, 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 and that, that is our vehicle, as far as I'm concerned. That, that is one of the, the most amazing things about this whole discussion to me. To me, it is the public that has showed us the vehicle. Mm -hmm. That, that, that we as academics have been trying with all, you, you know, to, um, to, to develop uh, um, over the time. And, and I think this is a vehicle. I think we need to seize this moment. We, 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 we need to wrap up the vehicle. We need to change the shape of the vehicle. And, 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 and we need to get going in a direction that the public is saying, this is the direction. This is really about how people want to be signified and represented in 2020. Yeah. I, 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 I do think, um, museums, um, monuments have a major role to play, but we have to do some rethinking mm -hmm. about what they represented in our society. Right. Um, oh, there's a question here about reparations and monuments, right? Um, this is a very big discussion in the, as it relates to the continent of Africa and the repatriation of historical uh, material culture. Um, that fall under the domain of um, multiple cultural identities on the continent. Um, do you think that, and, 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 and this is slightly devil's advocate, because some of the discussions are that <laughs> we don't have the infrastructure <laughs> to request the things that are produced by us, right? Um, and do you think that we should partner our demands for reparations and repatriations within this effort to, to reconceptualize the bridges around um, representation and access and education, um, which is in essence what a museum gallery slash space tries to do. This is, well, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but, <laughs> but it's a moment, but I think you actually have, you have a, I think it's a good idea to actually use this moment um, to actually ask for request <laughs> those objects, um, because I'm sure that I think the British Museum has um, Taino objects yes. of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is, this is, a, this is an opportune moment to, um, to try to get those objects um, of those objects back, whether it will work is a different story. But um, but yes, what an opportunity to tie to tie it together. <laughs> yes, um, and I think one of the limitations. Sorry, um, Heather, but one of in my own discussions with archaeologists um, and and colleagues who work on the um, 
the, in, the past, the, indig um, the legacy and, um, of the indigenous populations of the region, one of the issues, and I, I have this problem, especially when um, in the Jamaican context, when we come to celebrate independence and you have the same things every year, the kitchen bitch, which is the, the tilly lamp, um, the cursing lamp in the tin, um, the um, porcelain chimney and the grip, right? When people think about old time things, that is what is constantly replicated, right? But for those of us who are engaged in the kind of reflection of the material culture of the past, some of the best crafts pieces that are tied to the colonial era are made by either enslaved um, Africans, manumitted Africans, and even in the colonial era, black and brown persons. But those are not the items that are in the public domain as a reflection of the breadth and depth of the creative within the people of Caribbean descent. And um, I lost track of my question, but really, <laughs> um, I the, Yes, my statement. It's really about the Taino artifacts in the British Museum and that it's impossible to bring them to the, the region because we can't afford the insurance, right? So one of, by not having access to those, we fail to show the dynamism of the indigenous population. So they become almost dead identities, yes, even exactly. though we know that there are people in the region who are claiming that indigenous identity for themselves. And I think the role of um, material culture, monuments and arts is to encourage that level of diversity, which is something that Heather spoke about um, in terms of national identities. But I want to think about the correlation between monuments, art and heritage and the national, national values, right? Um, which is something that's also coming out in our discussions here. Danny, so, I, I, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, yes. Before you go on to the next question, I, I just want to say something that I mm -hmm. must ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, to me, this is part of the whole freedom process. Mm -hmm. It takes different stages. So I think emancipation was a process. Mm -hmm. I Reparations is a process that is ongoing, and part of that process is also the historicizing. So, so, right. so I see all of it related, and 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 I do think in that context, um, we need to ask um, for repatriation. I, I I think it must be done. I just yes. wanted to say that before you moved on to the next topic. Yes, no, I'm absolutely, absolutely, and I think too that if we involve, if we use monuments and material culture as part of our discussions around repatriation and reparations, it then expands people's understanding. You know, I think because the reparations movement lobbies for a rethinking of our past, but also the things that belong to us by putting a value on our things as opposed to somebody else's um, placing of value on our things. So absolutely, I agree with you. Heather, that that is that it's an absolute important part of um, um, <laughs> of um, of this discussion. Okay, I think another question that has come up is access. I think at one level, a discussion, a, a, a conversation with artists, with artists, is important. But I think another conversation is one of um, access and interpret access. And I think, um, well, okay, so let me just say what the question, what the statement was, which is one of the latest ones. Um, in relation to the Taino artifacts, where well, this person is referring specifically to the quest quest collections at the UE universe within the University of the West Indies about the fact that the Taino artifacts are tucked away in a building and then a lot of people don't know, right? So I think some of it is um, questions around access and um, and I guess we would say democratization. We may be touching back on some things that we've spoken about, but it, if in a classroom setting, because I think there we can have stakeholder debates, we can have 
TV and radio st stuff, but in a classroom setting, how, what do you think would be one of the more, well, in a non-classroom setting, if we were going to make the public space, do a Walter Rodney and make groundings the, format, the foundation of our engagement, how best do you think some of these discussions could take place? I don't know if that's a relevant question, but you guys can. Could you so if we were to make the public sphere our classroom in the way that Walter Rodney had done it mm -hmm. in his groundings, um, what methodologies do you think would be a useful way to facilitate a reinterpretation of, of the context and narratives? Well, I mean, for me, Shani, I mean, the, I, I hope it didn't come across, but maybe it did that, you know, I, I am a little fed up of talking about Nelson as a, <laughs> as a heritage practitioner and as a historian, I, f I feel that it has been dominating the discussion of heritage so much in Barbados that I don't even know, if we don't even have him there, I don't know what else we would talk about in terms of, of our heritage. And I think that's such a, a limited way of looking at the, the, the richness of what we have. I mean, I chose today very, very purposefully the background, my virtual background screen is, is a site called Newton Slave Burial Ground, which is probably about 10 minutes away from here um, in Christchurch. It's an archeological site in Barbados um, that is very well known across the region uh, because it's, it's one of the only um, sites that we have been able to detect, to find, to do archeology span um, uh, on slavery, slavery and burial practices. It's an extremely special site. I can tell you that almost every Barbadian probably does not even aware that it exists. And my point here is that we need to start thinking about our landscapes and our, our, our public spaces as places where we talk about, have discussions of not what's there, but what isn't there. Why, why have things been removed? Why are we not talking about this particular site um, virtually behind me? You know, why are we not talking about the records that are not in the archives uh, because somebody has purposely not given those archives, archival records of plantation documents over to a public space. Perhaps they're in some kind of attic in England or something. But the point is, is that we are not having the conversations that we could be having because we're talking about the, the representation that exists, that is there. And I, I I would like us to be able to move forward and move on in this process to think about that. Even when you're talking about the repatriation of objects, you know, part of the reparations debate and, and not, not the debate, the claim is that, you know, we shouldn't be saying that we can't afford the insurance. We should be saying to people, you've made a certain amount of money and traded on these, these objects for so long. You must repatriate them and repatriate them with the knowledge and the resources that we can display display them properly. Yeah. I mean, it should be part of that conversation. It's not just about giving money and it's not just about giving back. It's about repairing what the process that has created this erasure in our own museums and institutions. And I think that's what we really need to be addre addressing on our landscapes in the Caribbean. So I'll leave it there for now. Yeah. Um, Shani, when you spoke, it reminded me of, of something somebody said in our newspaper. We can turn our country into a school. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 yeah. and th 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 that's the, the 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 way we start. Um uh, the, the names of streets and, and areas and and and, mm. and we can identify with to understand really why this is so and how it should be viewed. So 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 yeah. I do think we need to, we need to look at the whole process. We we need to look at our approach to teaching the the, the projects we do, and mm -hmm. and need. I she I couldn't say it better. Make this issue, make our nation into schools by looking at our society and all these monuments and memorials and 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 and, and street names. And I think people will identify with that, understand that, and that will lead us to where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree. You know, several years ago, I went to, to um, Berlin 
And um, the first day I was there, I went to this particular site that um, allowed me to get access to um, sort of an iPod with um, that so I can, it's at, it was at the, um, the area where the the wall, the Berlin Wall had um, come down and um, I allowed me to do a walking tour of the city. And um, through, um, as I walked, I could hear stories from people who were um, at the site when the, um, when the walls came down. I could hear stories of people who lived during um, during the time of the of the separation between the two Germanys, um, and so I was hearing all these different experiences. So somebody had created um, some kind of program that allowed me to hear all of these great stories about the history of this place and these um, these buildings that I you know that I was passing as I went on my walking tour. It's a dangerous kind of <laughs> it can be dangerous. Uh, walking through a city with your headphones on, listening to stories, but but it was such um, it was such a wonderful experience, and this is a perfect example of the way that we can use our environment, our city, as a as a, as a space of education, right? Um, so there are lots of different ways, and I think you know having um, conversations with educators, to people who work in the culture culture industry, will give us all of these options. But as um, Heather is saying, that this is our this is an opportunity that we need to to kind of seize. Okay, so I think we're having just a really this this discussion really can't just end here, but we are going to wrap up to some final thoughts from each of you, um, and just to let our listeners know that we are recording this. Um, session. It will be posted to our um, YouTube account. So apologies again for the YouTube stream not working. And um, we will be going through your comments because obviously, you know, as as a museum practitioner, we are abs I am definitely in my own practice committed to this kind of engagement because it means that the more Caribbean nationals who buy in to um, museums, galleries, and material culture, it means that we have a better narrative. It become, our spaces become more representative of the people that we are supposed to be engaging. So this is, to me, is very important. So I'm going to ask each of my presenters to just, you know, your final thoughts on the discussion that we're having and possibly where we could go tomorrow. But we've been covering we, we, where we can go tomorrow, so you don't have to cover that, but <laughs> yes. Um, I, would, I would say three things. I think we need a, a, a process or understanding of the context we in historically to guide us. Um, I think that is important. The second thing, I, I, I would like to see us really um, transforming the sense of moving from sites of contestation to sites of conscience. Um, a signifier is there, and it's not simply about destroying a, 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 a statue or moving something, but what we want to change is the meaning attached to that. And, 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 and we need to create a different understanding. It doesn't make sense if we move Columbus, and but the meaning attached to him, we have, we have not changed. So that is also important. I, I, I think we have to look at it and think about it, discuss what we want to move, where we want to place it, what we want to see, what we want to put there. Um, but I think the other thing we have to talk about is what do we want to signify us in 2020? Mm -hmm. What are we going to replace what we are moving, what we are uh, uh, adjusting, what, what we are providing more information, what do we want to replace it with? I think that is the third part. So I am saying one, we need to have, it has to be done in a holistic way. We have to understand the context. We have to understand this moment in history. I think we need to move from contestation to creating sites of conscience. And I think we have to make sure that we create the right signifiers. What do we want to signify in 2020? So that, that's how I would sum up. Those are the three areas I think we need to concentrate on. 
what oh go ahead Katrina yeah. so what I was going to say um I'm not sure if I have three things but I will say um having looked at all these um controversies over um over a century um in the Caribbean um that this conversation is going to be ongoing and it's not this and it's going to repeat itself um so this is one thing that I will say this is not going to just um simply die die it will it will actually repeat itself um and the other thing which is um what i said in my presentation i really want us to really think about coming up not just with a guide well with a philosophy about um our um how we understand memory or how we understand um ourselves as a guide um to help us through where we go next. We as a community, a, a Caribbean community, really need to think about how we can use our experience to come up with a philosophy of memory that we can that 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 we can really use. Yeah, I mean I I want to echo um echo some of the 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 points that my co-panelists co make and especially Heather's point about changing meaning like I can as I've said I, I can talk about Nelson and there's a particular process that has gone that has come about for removing Nelson there was a process of creating a committee um establishing that there was a, an option and options for his removal that was 20 years ago nothing has happened significantly or substantially and seven i think it's now almost eleven thousand or twelve thousand people in barbados have signed a petition for his removal that is a process that has happened for that particular monument i don't want to leave anybody to leave here saying that we are going to just let down all of the monumental heritage of of our spaces our plantation sites etc i think we do need to have a, diff, a, a conversation about what these sites mean and how they can change and be more representative to us as a people. I grew up in Canada. I'm, I'm, I'm a, the daughter of, of West Indian immigrants. When I went to a Canadian heritage site, what was reflected to me is something about Canadian identity. It was never about the gaze of the tourist, the visitor. It was always about how is this site speaking to me and it might not have been speaking to me specifically as a Canadian, as being a, a child of immigrants, but to the Canadian experience. And I don't think we've really even talked about that, the space of tourism and what how tourism yeah. has distorted this, this image. And it made expectations for us not even to see ourselves on the landscape. These were not pristine places of of production. These were working plantations, working industrial sites where people lived and died. They had skills that they created amazing products. Why are we not talking about those processes? Why are not we why are we not seeing ourselves in the own our own history that we're reflecting to others? And that is what I really want us to think about embracing is how are we going to see ourselves on the landscape? And that is, the, to me, the most critical question behind meaning, okay? You might not see yourself in the meaning of Christopher Columbus, but where is it that you can change that narrative and discuss that the presence of that object on your landscape? Where is the best place to do that? And for Nelson, perhaps that is in a different setting. And I think we've, we've reached the end of this argument. Let us move on. Yeah. So I just, uh, this was a great, great, great conversation. I just want to thank each of my panelists, um, Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad. I will acknowledge that part of the limitation of this discussion is that we're English-speaking Caribbean islanders, and we're not necessarily representing all of the English speaking Caribbean. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, it would be interesting to know if we're having similar. So I would say that we said museums, uh, monuments in the Caribbean, but we're really speaking about monuments in Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad. So that's the first failing of, <laughs> of our panel, but it's a start of a conversation that we can begin to have with everyone in the region 
because I think one of the problems is that, as, as we've all touched on, that tourism is actually part of the problem of how we engage this discussion, even though our economies are completely, are very heavily reliant on it, some more than others. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to my panelists. We managed to, we had to change our date to make all of our schedules work. So thank you so much. I want to say thank you to my assistant who is not visible. She's busy, um, uh, Ms. Campbell, busy pulling the comments from um, our Facebook chat and putting it in the Zoom chat so we can respond to them um, as much as possible. We are going to go through some of the comments after this to um, respond, just to let you guys know that we've seen your comments, we're aware, and you know it, it may mean that we have a part two, and the part two is with artists, and a part three is with people in the French and Dutch and Spanish-speaking Caribbean, so that we can get a sense of where we are all standing and where we are all positioning, and, and it becomes accessible because it's not just us as academics having this conversation amongst ourselves. I also want to say thank you to Mr. Bailey from the um, CIO office and the regional headquarters who sat with us to rescue our streaming when YouTube wouldn't start. I just want to thank you all for joining us today. We will be posting this video on YouTube and we will send out a notice once it's up and loaded. So thank you all and all the best. And please thank remember you, to continue to wear masks to my audience <laughs> and physical distance where possible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shani.